Well, welcome, welcome you to this Sunday morning. This is our continued study of the study of Leviticus. And uh, so the study of Leviticus is the writing where it's pertaining to the Levites. And so in the book of Leviticus, God establishes a moral and, and what we call the purity laws that serve to set Israel apart from other nations. And so why? Because it was God's way of graciously providing a way for people to live in the presence of a holy God. You know, we have forgotten uh, pretty much, uh, Lady Karen, is that God is not us. He is a holy deity. He is God. He's the creator of all things. And, and, and he lives in, in purity. And there's no way that a holy God can just live around, you know, the sinfulness that uh, sin has created in the lives of people. So God, through his love for us, has created a way for people to live in his presence. <clears throat> now, if you didn't get a chance to go back and listen to Leviticus chapter 1 of last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. But uh, what this does, the book of Leviticus, we, we know that uh, it is the third book uh, in the Bible, and it's set right after Exodus uh, of the Israelites from their slavery when God brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai and invited Israel, listen, into a covenant relationship with God. And so now they had, uh, after God had done that, Israel had quickly rebelled and broken that covenant. And so God wanted for his glorious presence uh, to come and, and he wanted to live right in the midst with Israel and, and to form a, a tabernacle. Brother Jack, good to see you, brother. Love you, the Lord. And, uh, but Israel's sin, now I want you to write this down. Their sin, after we get through Genesis and Exodus and uh, now we're in Leviticus, but their sin had damaged their relationship, uh, which kept them from being in the presence of a holy God. So in the end of the previous book, in Exodus, Moses, as Israelite's representative, uh, could not even enter into God's presence uh, in the tent. So the book of Leviticus opens by reminding us that there's a fundamental problem. Now, at the end of Leviticus, uh, it's amazing that uh, after God goes through all of this instructions here, that he once again enters into the tent and talks with Moses. So we'll get, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So uh, the, the Lord called Moses uh, from his tent. So the question is, how can Israel, in their sin and in their selfishness, be reconciled to a holy God. And that's what the book is all about, how God is graciously providing a way for sinful and corrupt people to live in the presence of his holy presence, okay? So as we take and we deal with this, as we did last week, uh, we're going to be picking up in chapter two of this week, but there are some sacrifices that are, that we go into detail, and we wonder why uh, did God line this out? Uh, for example, salt. Uh, salt is always uh, God's grace, all right? And that's why salt was always added to every one of the sacrifices because without God's grace, uh, all these sacrifices and rituals they're going to do are meaningless. And so... Um, uh, there are three other sacrifices that were different ways of saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm reminded that you are a holy God, and I am truly, truly sorry uh, that, you know, we have broken, we've chosen to broken our, our relationship with you, our fellowship with you. And so God, through his grace and mercy, uh, Lady Karen, what a wonderful book. And Brother Jack, what a wonderful book. Um, you know, we have no excuse if we refuse the pleasant and the reasonable services 
that God is lining out here. We have no excuse uh, for uh, uh, not, not being in the presence of God because God made a way. So Leviticus is unquestionably from the origin of the responsibilities of the Levitical priesthood line and their role in the life of Israel to guide Israel to understand that in order to be back into a relationship with a holy God, that there must be a repentive heart. There must be a change of action or the way we live our lives. And so we get to Leviticus chapter 2, and in many things God uh, leads us to fix what shall be uh, or, or, you know, spent in his service, uh, whether of our time or our substance, but yet uh, it's always God's providence. You know, we always say, well, how can I fix it? Well, God says, here's a way to fix it. And so he goes through some details on the offerings that we talked about last week. And now we're going to begin with what's called the meat offering of flour. Okay. In Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let's begin to read. I do read from the King James Version Bible. And I hope you'll read along. You'll find out it's very easy to understand. When people tell me, oh, I just can't understand the Bible, it's because they're not reading it. Or they're, you know, they're not asking the Holy Spirit to open up their hearts and their minds. Uh, it's really a, the simplicity is there. So in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, he says, and, and when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense therein. Verse 2, And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons the priest, and he shall take thereout his handful. Notice that. His handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar. So what is this? It's a memorial to be an offering made by fire and fire is always symbolic of the presence of a holy God. And so he says, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire, a sweet savor. Now, a sweet savor is something that has a pleasant taste or a pleasant smell that is totally received, okay? And it says it's unto the Lord. And the remnant, he goes on to say, and the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his sons. And it says it is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. And if thou bring an oblation of a meat offering. Now, circle that word oblation. I'll give you the definition here in a minute. And he says, and if thou bring an oblation of a meat offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cake of fine flour. Notice the word fine. Mingled with oil. Bless you. Uh, and unleavened uh, wafers anointed with oil, and then he goes on to say, "And if it, if thy oblation be a meat offering, okay. Now oblation is where something's being offered to God, okay. Something of holiness offered to God to be a meat offering baked in a pan. It shall be a fine flour unleavened. That now many a times uh, when you think of the word leaven." Uh, that's many times refers to sin in the Bible symbolically. So here it is unleavened, okay, mingled with oil. Oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil therein. It is a meat offering. So he says the flour offering is going to become a meat offering. Now that's important. Because in the meat offerings, they're not, that's not something that's always just consumed on the fire. In fact, a lot of it's left over for you and I to consume. Okay? And so he says, 
And if thy oblation be a meat offering baked in the frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil, verse 8. And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of, of these things unto the Lord. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it into the altar. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his sons. Did you get that? So remember I told you a while ago that they're going to take a portion of this and they're going to make it as an offering. It's going to be a memorial. It's going to remind them of what it's for. But then they're going to consume it later. It says in verse 10, it is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Now he says, no meat offering uh, which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall uh, uh, be made with leaven, and of course, uh, that that was leaven was considered that of a uh, uh, a symbolic of sin. He says, so nothing shall be. In other words, sin cannot be mixed with this offering. And ye shall burn no leaven nor any honey and any offering of the Lord made by fire. Now, why is that important? You see, we live in a culture, a generation today, that says, Lord. God is a, hi Catherine and James, good to see you, that God is a loving God, and I believe he is. He's a God that cares about us, I believe he does. But the problem with that is, you and I need to understand, he's a holy God, one that cannot dwell among sins. So here's the mentality of people today. And it probably fits in, in my uh, vocabulary as much as yours, is God, I love you, and I know you're a holy God, but, you know, I'm a sinner, so just accept me the way I am, and I don't have to change anything, And but to be in your presence, you're just going to have to let me in. And that's not the way God operates. You see, God is all about the cleansing. And so if we're going to be in the presence of a holy God, then we can't just go escalating ourselves in there and just say, hey, God, you're just going to have to deal with it. You know, I, I'm a sinner, uh, whether it be a, 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 some form of sinful practice or, and I'm just going to call it out, even a sexual preference today, you know, well, you know, and, and yet we're going to say, well, God, you're just going to have to deal with it and accept it. Well, I got news for you. God doesn't have to deal with that and accept it because you demanded it. And so God says, if you want to get back into a relationship with me, so we can have a sweet covenant, then I'm going to give you some things to do to remind you as a memorial that you would always have a repentive heart and realize that there's some things that you need to clean up. If you're going to be in my holy presence, he says, that, as I am holy, be ye holy. So uh, we, we have to understand that we need to devote not only just some form of you know worship to him, but, but also our service to him, our lives to him. And, uh, and so we, we're talking in chapter 2 of Leviticus about uh, the meat offering, okay? And, and so when he talked about a, a sweet savor, that means a pleasant taste or a pleasant smell. And notice it says, unto the Lord. It's got to be fitting unto him, okay? And so as we read in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the meat offering often many a times might typify that of Christ, but it's more than that in this chapter. It, 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 it uh, presented to God, uh, it was presented to God for us as being the bread of life for our souls was, but they rather seem to denote an obligation to God. Now I want you to write that phrase, an obligation to God. And, uh, and, and yet these are things that needed to be accepted, you know, to God. And, uh, and, and so the term meat, it was, and it still is properly given in the, what's called the provisions or a greater part of the offering was to be eaten for food and not burned. So this was a provisional offering. It wasn't just some ritualistic thing you're going to do. It was something that you were going to consume. It was going to benefit you. Now, out beside that on your outline, write this. 
it will benefit me. So these meat offerings are mentioned after the burnt offerings because they're going to benefit me. They're going to benefit you. And so think about this. Without an interest in the sacrifice of Christ and without a devo being devoted our heart to God, then none of these uh, offerings could be accepted by God. You had to, number one, realize that it was, we had to have an interest in the sacrifice of Christ, and we had to have a heart that wanted to say, I'm going to be devoted to God. So leaven is the emblem of pride, malice, hypocrisy, and honey is always that in the Bible of a sensual pleasure, okay? So that's why I made the statement I did earlier, is God, uh, and today people have what I call sexual preferences that they prefer, but they don't line up with the Word of God. Just recently we got kind of a, uh, attacked and, you know, for our stand and that we want to follow the Word of God and we, we want to be part of the Word of God and we're not perfect. You know, that's why we need grace. We need mercy and love and forgiveness. Don't get me wrong with that. And so we're not rejecting anyone. We're just saying this, that God's word says this about that. And so we're called out to come out and become you separate, saith the Lord. And so uh, there are things that we have chosen to uh, do what the Bible says. is We're, to, we're not going to try to be a part of something that's going to take and try to harm anyone's relationship. Uh, what, what I mean by that is I, we can't accept the world's standards and expect it to be now God's standards. God has not changed. Can I get a hallelujah on that? And he's not going to change. He's not going to change uh, what he says about sin just for you and I to, to appease us. No. It's not about appeasing us. It's about appeasing God. And, and so uh, you have to understand that these graces, that's what these offerings were. They were graces of humility and, and love and, and sincerity, uh, which God approves us uh, of. And, and so you have to understand that Christ in his character and Christ in his sacrifice was wholly free from all the sinful things that were out there. Even though he was tempted as us, but he didn't give in to them. He didn't, he didn't give prey to them. So uh, his people, listen, we are called to follow and to be like him. So what was the offering of the first fruits? Well, let's continue to read. So when it says the oblation, now, the oblation in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 12 through 16, means a thing that's presented or offered to God. Did you get that? So jot that down. Out beside Leviticus chapter 2, circle the word oblation. It's a thing that is presented or offered to God. And he says, so the oblation of the first fruits. Ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. All right? Savor is what? It's something that is, it's a taste. It's, it's good food or drink. It's something that is enjoyed completely. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Okay? So when we do these oblations before the Lord, it must be what? Presented uh, to God from us. And it's, it's, it's a reminder to remind us that, that we have sinned and broken our, our fellowship with God. And, and God loves us so much. He wants us to get back into that relationship, that fellowship that we had. But we can't just go on living the simple lives that we're living. And so he says, I want to remind you. And he talks about the first fruits that you shall offer them unto the Lord but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor, all right? So every oblation of the meat offering, he goes on to say, uh, thou shalt season with salt. Now that's important. Circle the word salt. So salt is required in every one of the offerings that we're going to be looking at throughout the book of Leviticus. Why? Write this down. Salt 
represents grace. So without God's grace, then all these offerings are meaningless. So God hereby initiates them that their sacrifices in themselves is unsavory. And remember we talked about the savory while ago, something that was well pleased of God, well received of God. So unless you added the salt, let's go back and look in chapter 2, verse 13. And he says, season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God. Notice what it's a representation of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. In other words, it was required that it be added. And he says, with all thy offerings, thou shalt offer salt. Did you get that? All of your offerings. Why? Salt is required. Why is salt required? Symbolically, it represents the grace, the grace of God. Without the grace of God being applied to what we're doing, whether it be going to church, whether it be reading our Bible, whether it be praise and worship, it's meaningless, all right? So, so once again, all religious services must be seasoned with grace. Christianity, we talk about, is the salt of the earth. So even Christianity, if it's not seasoned with the presence of God, if it's not seasoned uh, with God's presence in our life, then our Christianity is worthless. So uh, directions are given now about the offerings and the first fruits of the harvest. It ought to bring about a, a harvest, right? And so if a man with a thankful sense of God's goodness and giving them a plentiful crop was disposed to present an offering to God, uh, then let him bring the first ripe of the full ear. So if you're going to give something to God, give it your best. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I'm going to give my life to God, I ought to not just be some church goer. I need to give God my best. And I need to understand that God's presence is what this is all about. And and we're guilty when, when Israel had gone through Exodus. As soon as they got out, they sinned greatly before God. And so now God's going to take in, in the book of Leviticus. And I apologize for messing with my nose today. But i got a little allergies going on, I guess. But please understand that, that salt was required of all the offerings. So if I were to go to church and just listen to some preacher preach without understanding that this is uh you know to be seasoned with the with the grace of god the love of god the presence of god then it's meaningless it has no purpose and, and so so whatsoever was brought to god must be the best in it of its kind and even if it was just the green ears of the corn give god your best but then he talks about when you do you had to, this is what this is so cool. He says you had to add the oil or the frankincense. Frankincense, you have to put that on there. And so oil and frankincense is always that of the Holy Spirit. And so when you think about wisdom and humility, what does that do? What does wisdom and humility do for you and I? Here's what it does: it softens our hearts and it sweetens our spirit. So that, that, that when we begin to serve God, we want to serve God with things that are going to be completely acceptable to God. So the lifestyles that you and I have chosen, and I'm telling you, I'm a sinner just like you are. And, and I'm, I am not one of those self-righteous. I think everybody that tries to take that role, they're, they're being foolish automatically. We're just sinners and and need of God's grace and God's love and God's mercy, but uh, God is still a holy God, and God takes delight in what's called the ripe fruits of the Spirit, God the Spirit, and uh, so holy love to God is the fire by which all offerings must be made. The reason why we're doing this because we're in love with God. The reasons why we go to the church is we're in love with God. The reason why we even read the Bible because we're in love with God. 
The reason why we would take time out and have prayer in the morning is because we're in love with God. So without our love for God, then all of these things are meaningless, okay? And 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 we talked about the excellency of uh, in Christ and his work as our mediator, uh, which, uh, you know, people understand is that you and I cannot mediate ourselves before God on our own. We need a mediator, and that's Jesus the Christ the Lord, right? And so our dependence thereof must be so entire that we must never lose sight of it in anything we, that we do if we're going to be accepted of God. This is not about trying to be accepted of mankind. This is being accepted of God. So if you want to continue living your life in a way that just, if you want to stay in the sewer and you want to live in sin and and then you want to go to church and praise God and tell God how wonderful he is and have no desire to allow God's word and God's spirit to help you to clean up your life so you can be in the presence of a holy God. Well, that's your business. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible keeps talking about these offerings. And they were to be what? Memorials, reminders that we are sinners and that we do serve a holy God pure God. And I cannot go in there just walking in and saying, God, you're going to have to accept, you know, the way I'm going to live my life, uh, whether it be physical, sexual, whether it be psychological, whatever. Lord, you're just going to have to deal with it, but I'm still going to enjoy your presence, God. And God says, no, wait a minute. I'm a holy God. And if you're going to take and be in my presence, then we got to deal with some things about some memories about what what holiness is okay and so uh as we look at this he says whenever you take an offer of this offering up this flower offering i want it to be fine i want it to be pure as it could be and i want you to add the oil that's the picture of the holy spirit so that's why so many they they go to church or, or Bible study say I didn't get nothing out of it. Well, of course you're not going to get nothing out of it and everything because you're not depending on the Holy Spirit to give you anything from it. You got to be in the presence of God, and and so in Leviticus chapter three as we move on because that's what's going to be Leviticus chapter two, but we're going to go ahead and go also right into Leviticus chapter three. But I want you to understand as we look at this uh, is that. We need to pause for a second and explore the important idea. Say it with me. God is holy. He's holy, right? And that's what this book here is all about. And it's all about how gracious that God is to provide a way for sinful, corrupt people like me and like you to find a way to get it fixed so we can live in his presence. And so in the Bible, God is set apart from all the other things as being the unique role as a creator and the author of himself. And so it is God that is holy. And then the space around God is holy. So if God is holy, the space around God is holy. And if, if we're going to be in God's holiness, then we must realize that we are in the fullness hi misty we are in the fullness of his life and in his purity and in his justice so if israel who is unjust and sinful wants to live in god's holy presence then they need to be able to be reminded that they need to take and and raise their level of existence their level of life uh to be in that presence so their sin has to be dealt with and likewise today, America, oh my word, the mentality that I'm seeing in the world today, hi Cheryl, so good to see you, we're starting the book of Leviticus, is that we, we, we demand that God accept our sinful lives, and that we're not going to change it, we're not going to deal with it, God's going to have to deal with it, you know, or we're just not going to have anything to do with God, well, what a sad state we're in today and what is a, a scary state to think that God we're going to force God to accept my sinful actions 
and just saying, God, I'm not going to change. So you're. Well, once again, as we're preaching the word of God, it happened last week and the week before. We keep losing our internet connection all through our phone. And so we're just going to have to trust God to show us where to go and what to do and where to come from. So I hope that people will log back in and be a part of this. But there are three. We're in the book of Leviticus. And so three other sacrifices were, were different ways of saying sorry to God. God, we're sorry that we, we haven't, that we haven't, you know, lived up to this. Hi, Catherine James. Thanks for logging back in. I don't know what's going on with the internet. Uh, but so there are three sacrifices of, of showing God, hey, we're sorry. Will you forgive us? We want to make this right. We don't want to go back into that, into that, uh, into the clay pit. We don't want to go back into the mire and, and the simple way of living a life. And Lord, we really want to clean up our life and we want to be in that relationship with you so we can love you and serve you and enjoy you and you can enjoy us. So, uh, this is important because here in Israel, uh, it says, I will offer up the lifeblood of an animal while confessing, listen, confessing their sin was created uh, and their sin had created a more evil on the earth because of the death that sin has bringing upon mankind and, and so uh, God is showing them that that you've got to go through the blood it's a blood hi Jack glad that you're jumping back on brother pray that we keep our internet connection going but three other sacrifices were differently ways of saying God, I'm sorry. It's not about just living in my sin and, and practicing my sin and, and expecting to be in the presence of a holy God. So that's why repentance today is it, not talked about a lot. People just, just want to take and go to church. They just want to have a good little time and enjoy the singing and stuff. But yet they, they, they leave and nothing's changed. Their lives are the same. But yet we're dealing with a holy God. And if you're dealing with a holy God, that means that everything around God is holy. And if I'm going to take and want to be in that environment with God, then I need to allow God to help me with my sin, to overcome it, have it blotted out, so that I can have his righteousness in my life, that I can be in the presence of a holy God. So in the second set of rituals, we know that, that uh, uh, of course, the first set, God was trying to t tell them about the seriousness of their sin and what it had done to them and being in, that they couldn't be in the presence of a holy God. And that was the whole idea of God bringing them out of Exodus to exit out of is God wanted them to be his people. He wanted to be their God. But once again, as soon as they got out, Lady Karen, boom. They really messed up. Go back and read it. It's amazing. Hi, Starlet. Good to see you. And, and so we were reminded of the consequences of the evil of their actions. And so God says, we're going to have to fix this. I don't want you living in that state. No parent would want their child living in, in, at the bottom of the barrel and, and having their life ruined. No, a, a, a parent says, hey, I want you to have a better life than that. Well, God is no different. So the second set of rituals that uh, we're going to deal with in the book of Leviticus lays out seven annual feasts of Israel. And each of these uh, uh, is going to retell uh, uh, a different part of the story about how God redeemed them from the slavery in Egypt and brought them through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. So, and by celebrating these feasts regularly, Israel would remember, remember it's a book of remembrance. They would remember who they were and who God was to them. He's my God. He's my creator. Now, the section's about Israel's priests. Uh, you have Aaron and his sons, uh, they are first ordained to enter into God's presence on behalf of Israel. And then in this matching section, we find the qualifications of just being a priest. The priests were called to the highest level of moral integrity. 
the highest level of ritual holiness because they represented the people before God and they also represented God to the people. So we find out that the priest, that holiness mattered to be a priest. Back here in this first section that we read, right after the family of Aaron was ordained, his two sons waltz right into God's presence and and they just absolutely openly violate the rules of walking into God's presence. And so they are consumed. If you go back and read it, God consumed them with the fire uh, by God's holiness right there on the spot. It's a haunting reminder of the paradox of living in God's holy presence because of pure goodness and because it is dangerous to those who rebel and insult God's holiness. Let me say it again. America, listen. It is dangerous to those who rebel and insult God's holiness. And it's important that Israel's priests become holy. And also that all the people of Israel follow the example to become holy. Uh, in order to have the next set of chapters 11 through 15. And they're, they're about a ritual purity required of all Israelites. And then in chapters 18 through 20 is about moral purity of the people. Now, let me say, say it again. We're living in a day and age where there pretty much there's no moral purity at all. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to even be on Facebook or be part of any organization. And man, you're seeing all kinds of sexual agendas being thrown in your face and saying, you must accept this. And, and no, folks, God doesn't have to accept that, you know. But if you're going to be part in the presence of a holy God, we need to be reminded that our sins have separated us from God in the first place. And if it separated us from God so that Christ had to go to Calvary and die for our sins, to pay for our sins, so that his righteousness would cover our unrighteousness, so we can be in the presence of a holy God, in a likewise manner, so should the way we live our lives. God takes delight in the first ripe fruits of the Spirit and, and, and our devotion to God and the frankincense he talked about denotes the meditation and the intercession of Jesus Christ by which our services are accepted. Anything I do outside of God's grace is not accepted of God. Anything I do outside of God's mercy is not accepted of God. Anything I do outside of God's presence to God is unacceptable if it's not done in the presence of God. So, you know, in chapters 18 through 20, it's about the moral purity of the people. And today, people get, oh my gosh, uh, people get so mad today when, when we as a Christian say, you know, I'm not going to support that. I'm not going to be a part of that. Uh, whether it be the abuse of, uh, like Karen, you and I were talking, if somebody's abusing children or animals or the elderly, I'm not going to support that. If anybody's going to try to corrupt the minds of children uh, with books that have to do with sexual uh, perversion, that's what I'm going to call it, uh, you know, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to promote that. I'm just telling you, uh, I'm not going to go out and jump up and down and, and, and support people that, that think abortion is just to be done, like having an Oreo cookie, you know, and that in Joel Olstein's church. Uh, the women that stood up and took their clothes off and said, my mind, my body, my choice, and all that. Folks, listen, what an ungodly generation we live in today. That's all I'm called for. Does that make sense? And yet we're to call that acceptable. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to the Word of God. It's not acceptable uh, in the presence of God, especially a holy God. And it should not be acceptable to us. So what's wrong when you and I decide just to waltz into God's presence carrying symbols of death and impurity in our bodies? 
The, the answer is just don't do that. Why? Now, the, the, the last way of becoming impure was by eating certain animals based on Leviticus. And, and people talk about kosher food laws are found right there in that section, right? And, but now we, we have a lot of theories about why certain animals were considered impure or maybe even off limits. So why? Why were they off limits? It's simple. God wanted them to promote good hygiene and to avoid cultural taboos, all right? And the text, and you say, yeah, but it isn't that clear. You know, it's not in black and white. Thou shalt not boom. Well, sometimes just some common sense has to fit in, and we're lacking that quite a lot today. But wisdom and humility always softens and sweetens the spirits uh, and the services of young people and, and older people and and even, even the green ears of the corn are acceptable to God. It's not about how old you are. But frankincense often denoted the meditation. Now grab that word meditation. Where you really thought about it. You thought it through. And we thought about the intercession of Christ. Christ came to remove what? The sin of the people before the eyes of a holy God. And so if sin had affected our original relationship with God, don't you think that sin is also going to affect our fellowship with God today? You know? And so uh, here in, in the corresponding sections that we're about to go over, and, and of course we're about to close out right now, uh, it's going to deal with Israel's moral uh, purity or their lack of purity. And so the, the Israelites were called to live differently than the Canaanites. So they were to care for the poor instead of overlooking the poor. They were to have a high level of sexual integrity, and they were to promote justice throughout the entire land, equal to all, right? Now here in the center of this book, now this is important, here in the center of this book, we find a description of one of Israel's annual feasts called the Day of Atonement. The odds that, that not every Israelite sin and uh, or rebellion would be covered through the individual sacrifices. So once a year, the high priest would take two goats and one of them would become what's called, known as the purification offering and atone for the sins of the people. And the other was considered the scapegoat. So write those down, all right? One was considered the purification offering, symbolic of that, and the other was the scapegoat. So the priest would confess the sins of Israel and symbolically place them on the goat, and it would be cast out into the wilderness. Now, let me close with this. Again, this is a very powerful image of God's desire, listen, to remove sin. That's why he put the sin on the goat and had it go out into the wilderness. It was God's desire to remove sin and that would remove the consequences from his people so that God could live with them in peace. Oh, let me just say this one more time. I hope you get this. Because even in my life, I look over my life and I'm going, man, what was I thinking? How did I ever get involved in that? But God showed me that there was a way that in spite of my stupidity, in spite of my ignorance and my sinfulness, that God was going to provide a way to remove the sin and the consequences from my life. That The sins that kept me from God, the sins that kept me from enjoying the peace with God, and, and that understand how much he loves me and his grace and his mercy is so so here we find that that if you want to see how the, the Leviticus fits into the big storyline it's helpful to first take a look at the next book the Bible calls the book of numbers so what were you saying that our dependency must be so entire that we must never lose sight of of anything that we do or that we practice or be a part of if we're going to be accepted of God. He's a holy God. 
And so I need to let the Holy Spirit clean up my mind, to clean up my mouth, to clean up my heart. Folks, listen, and to clean up my lifestyle. That my life would be more acceptable and pleasing to God because of his grace and mercy. So it's not about me throwing my garbage on God and saying, God, you deal with it. You accept it. You know, I live in a sinful world. I have a sinful life. I want these sinful practices. Practices. I have these uh, sinful choices I've made in my life. So God, you just deal with it. And God says, no, you're going to deal with it. Or you're going to have the consequences that go along with it. And one of those is, is we are a sinner. Deal with it because of Adam and Eve. And there's consequences. Deal with it. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Luke 16, 19 through 31. Go back and read it. Hi, D. Good to see you. Deal with it. Guys, listen, you're going to draw your last breath. You're going to stand before this awesome, incredible, holy, powerful creator known as our God that is pure in every manner. And all of our stupidity, well, my choices, I should say, are going to be unacceptable. They're going to be without excuse. And God's going to say, you know, I provided a savior to take away the sin of the world and the sins in your life. Why would I do that and say, oh, it's okay for you to go back and live in these sinful ways and, and to be in the presence of a holy God? Well, that's not going to happen. So it's all about God telling us to come out from among them and be a separate, that we might enjoy the peace of having that beautiful relationship with God, a holy God, living with a people who said, we want to live holy now. We want to raise our level of standards and we want to enjoy the presence of God. So what about you? You say, well, you start out, first of all, understanding that, that you need to get saved and you got to get saved by the blood of a sinless lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That was the first step. But after we get saved, then our old sinful body tries to go back into those practices. And that's why 1 John 1, 9, go back and write that down. 1 John 1, 9. There's a reason why it says that we need to confess our sins. And if we do, he's willing and faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to what? To cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Now, why would I want to have a life that's cleansed? so I can enjoy the presence of a holy God because God is holy. He cannot live in a sinful condition and he wants his people to become holy and he's made a way for us to be reminded that we can do that. I hope today's lesson has helped you. I hope that you'll let the Holy Spirit just tug at your heart and say, you know, you're right. I need, I need for the Holy Spirit to clean up my, the way I think and the way I speak and the, how I, what comes out of my heart and my life. And, and, and I just... I need to really meditate, spend some time with God and say, God, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? So if you're not saved, and it's the same thing. God, I'm sorry. I'm guilty. It's like the thief on the cross. I, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Would you remember me, the thief said on the cross, when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, today. See, there was a way. Today thou wilt be with me in paradise. First John 1, 9 says, hey, but like Israel, if you mess up, you need to confess your sins to God. And then go back and read 1 John chapter 2. It's amazing. We have an intercessor named Jesus who loves you with all this, his whole being. And he wants you to have the best life possible. But he knows what consequences of sin does to an individual. So he says, let's clean that up. Let's clean. Why don't you dedicate yourself to God today? God, from this moment on, I'm going to... I'm going to, with your help and your leadership and your guidance, I'm going I'm to look at things that, from the Word of God that I can clean some things up that I can enjoy the presence with you on a day-by-day -day basis. Father, forgive us of our sins. Help us, lead us, and guide us that our desire would be to be in the presence of a holy God and that you would help us to have lives that would allow us to enjoy that presence more. We love you. I pray our lives will be 
a sweet savior, it would be totally acceptable to you. And that Lord, you could bless through us and help us to bring others to Jesus Christ. We love you. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Don't forget our website at lyitl.org. We'll see you back here at 6 o'clock tonight. And hopefully we'll have a lot better reception. God bless you all. Thanks for tuning in.